Hello guys, this is Adam Leonardo Cap. Welcome to my channel Physics for Fun. In this video, we are going to talk about something different. So what's different today? Today, we are going to talk about what is dark matter. As you have probably heard about dark matter, that our universe has something so much stuff which is made by something so much strange which we which we cannot actually see and neither these kind of matters is actually inter uh, interacting with kind of ordinary matter which is which we are calling baryonic matters they are not actually interacting with anything so we are going to discover we are going to actually find what kind of this strange matter what is the behavior of this dark matter now there are so many lectures in dark matter but my lecture is kind of a different because i am going to cover some technical detail so that you can by yourself actually discover more about the dark matter and you can have so much research idea how the dark matter how you can hunt for dark matter and what kind of particle may be best candidate for dark matter and what kind of mass what is the mass range maybe if you want to detect dark matter in your near future like 10 to 20 years after what kind of range you have to look for so let us start now you can see here there is an in, in 1933 fritz Zwicky, there was a first astronomer who actually uh, saw a coma cluster it's a it's a picture of now you can see here it's a picture of coma cluster where there is there are so many spiral galaxies and there are lights you can see here these red lights are corresponds to this infrared wavelength and these green lights corresponds to short wavelength now you can see here so many green lights these green lights are coming from these dwarf galaxies these galaxies these galaxies are not as big as our own galaxy like milky way but they are small in nature and they have this green light because uh, they have very short wavelengths. Now, uh, in 1933, when Fritz actually saw the coma cluster and observed, tried to observe the motion of galaxies, he found something really peculiar. What he found that after some uh, distances, what he would say, if you are applying if you are in solar system for an example and if you are going away from the sun so for the planets which are so much far away from the sun like you see jupiter saturn so their velocity actually has to decrease but what he has observed that these galaxies in coma cluster after certain distance like 10 megaparsec so 10 kiloparsec and so on their velocity as expected from Newton's law has to be decreases like V is proportional to inverse of 1 by square root of R. But what he has observed that velocity remains constant like 150 kilometers per second, which is completely strange. And hence he said that there must be some extra mass which is unseen must be there in order to have these kind of observations where your velocity after going after going away from like this is the picture of this uh, milky way and as you go away from the center of the galactic center of the galactic disk or the galaxy the velocity must decreases but here the velocity remains flattened means the velocity is the velocity becomes constant now so he was the first person actually named this dark matter because it's unseen it's not interacting now another evidence these are the evidence how you can detect by astrophysical examples that there is a dark matter okay second example is gravitational lensing now you haven't i i don't know you have probably uh, heard in uh, uh, you have not uh, studied or heard about this gravitational lensing like we have this we have studied this a uh, lensing phenomena with the help of some lens like convex lens concave lens there is another thing called gravitational lensing means if you have so much so many so much massive star or galaxy which actually bends light when the light rays actually passes uh, passes from some kind of a region where you can see the bending of light too much and because of this bending 
you have this gravitational lensing effect. So what is detail actually, what is detail of our gravitational lensing? Now you can see here, as Einstein has predicted that our universe has a four dimension, three dimension of the space and one dimension of time, and he has named it space time. So gravitation is nothing but actually manifestation of space time. So whenever you have some kind of heavy object like quasars or black holes or galaxy like here, so it actually bends the space time curve. Now you are watching this distant galaxy from here and light is coming from there. Now you are observing here from earth. Now if light, if the light beam is coming from this uh, distant galaxy and passing from this gravitational uh, potential, we are calling it gravitational potential, means how much it has bending called gravitational potential and if you are seeing the light coming from this distant galaxy which is indicated by this one so light has to travel in a straight line but due to bending of the space it has to follow this bending of uh, space time and you will see you will actually observe this kind of image where you see this the image of this galaxy is scattered like this so we are called this kind of thing is called lensed so the image gets distorted and the distortion depends on what is the mass of this galaxy or black hole or so on. So the, the actually uh, how this, uh, uh, how this uh, image is got distorted actually depend on the host galaxy or black holes and so on. More the mass, more will be bending and so on. So with the help of this, you can find out what is the mass of the galaxy or the black holes and so forth and so on. Now uh, in right side, you can see here some kind of image with blue and pink light. What is this? Okay, composite image of matter, matter inside galaxy cluster IE1E06576 known as bullet cluster. So these are known as bullet clusters. So bullet clusters are small galaxies which are actually orbiting around this Milky Way or some bigger galaxy and when they are actually colliding, so there are something strange happens. So if you are mapping this kind of collision, what you are going to see that uh, because of the matter, the present in the galaxy is actually emitting some radiation and these are radiation in the correspondence to X-ray. So you have when, when, if you are having this X-ray telescope, you can see the emitters see the radiation and these radiations are actually described by this pink light. So when you see that, you, have, you would have idea what is the distribution of mass of this uh, galaxy and so forth and so on. So when you see this, you, so you see this uh, pink region. And when you have this gravitational lensing, now you are look for some kind of a galaxies and now the light is coming from other galaxies and you see how this uh, distortion goes on. So you map this gravitational lensing with this blue region. Now you see these two regions are separated. But from the X-ray you see the region of pink is very little. So you have seen that okay fine must be this galaxy have the mass in this only region. But gravitational lensing says that there are so many masses around there but these masses are actually not visible. It's not actually interacting also. So you have collision and all these things. But these blue lines, these blue regions, they are very separate regions. You have this galaxy, you have the masses in the galaxies and these gases actually have some kind of friction goes on and so on. Therefore, you can see here some kind of a bullet type. Okay, this is the bullet type shape and this bullet type shape is due to the friction between the gases. And now blue region and this pink region, they are not actually colliding. It also evidence that these data which are uh, uh, which actually found from this NASA, CXC, Arizona and so on. These data shows that these actually regions are completely collisionless. So one can say that dark matter is actually not producing any light and another thing is that it's not interacting with the visible matter or baryonic matter which have uh, which we are made up of and which is with the matters which are around us and it's also collisionless so it means the distribution is some kind of a spherical way and it's kind of a it's doing nothing well now let's understand what he has done in 1933 mr fritz schilke 
So suppose if I am going to model a galactic disk, suppose our Milky Way, which has been radius 10 to the power 6 and the width because you have the all the stars come somewhere the thickness we can say is half kiloparsec and suppose the number of stars is 10 to by 11 and the mass of star and mass of stars are 5 into 10 to by 10 uh, solar mass this m with this big dot corresponds to the solar mass and there are uh, uh, supermassive big uh, supermassive black holes in the center of the galaxy which is everywhere which having mass is 10 to the power 6 solar mass. So the radius of if I am assuming the average radius of these stars are 2 into 10 to the power minus 8 parsec. In parsec it is another uh, unit for measuring the length and we are assuming that okay all the stars are actually have some kind of a velocity because they are actually moving having the average velocity kind of 50 kilometers per second. Now if you are going to calculate time of collision the time of collision is nothing but 1 over n the number of density of these stars and the sigma which is cross section so sigma is nothing but pi r square pi is pi r square means the all the because you want to you want to figure out what is the collision between these stars so you have to find the cross section area the cross section area you can just approximate by this circular shape so pi r square r is radius of the stars and n is nothing but number of stars per unit volume so you have this uh, galactic disk over volume you know the 4 by uh, you know it is pi r cube or 4 by 3 pi r cube so and there is a velocity for all stars which is 50 kilometer per second and you have this collision time of collision is 10 to 21 years so you see if you want to find out the collision between stars in a milky way the time period is kind of a 10 to 21 it's more than the universe age because universe age is 31.5 billion years it's more than this one so we can easily say that the, the motion the dynamics of a star is not governed by collision of stars so all the motion of stars is actually governed by this kind of feature which is called gravitational feature now you want to look for this motion dynamics of stars that how we, how these stars actually moving in the Milky Way and now we are saying that suppose these stars actually moving in a Milky Way in a circular direction so we can easily apply this Newton's law like just like you are applying Newton's law all the time like half mv square is equal to gmm by re or r some distances so from Newton's law you can say that v is equal to square root of gm disk by this is the mass of disk complete disk by r now if uh, you are inside the disk the velocity increases as proportional to r but as you go down because this is the mass disk you are you can apply the gauss law and you can see that v is inversely proportional to r this is the matter you go from this uh, disk you go away from the disk the velocity has to decreases with respect to r so this is the this is the thing you must uh, need it uh, maybe from the newton's law we can say that this has to be observed but what experiments we found is that after certain uh, distance means after certain 10 kiloparsec what happens this velocity got flattened out now you say uh, there is nothing but uh, there is nothing beyond this galaxy disk yeah obviously there are so many satellite galaxy means uh, the, the little galaxies are there and all the stars and so forth are uh, something beyond this galaxy disk and there are so many uh, just like in coma cluster there are collection of galaxies are there you can so there are there may be some bigger galaxy and there are small galaxy around so you can find the motion of all those things so the motion of those things got flattened out as you go from parent as you go away from this parent density so from that do you conclude that okay there must be additional mass actually produce this kind of effect and this additional mass we cannot observe we cannot see in our laboratory and hence it is not interacting with light therefore it's electromagnetic neutral and this uh, this dark mass is actually proportional to r so as you go increases increases with r uh, so mass of dark uh, so dark matter mass is actually increases now if you want to find what is the density so density is so if you are going to assume now here you can see this is our milky way and this is the halo it is formed because we are assuming that because now what what is why this kind of shape 
actually you see for your uh, Milky Way because this baryonic mass have interaction and due to interaction so they are actually uh, uh, what happens is uh, because of interaction there is a friction goes on it's actually uh, emitting so much energy losing so much energy and hence it just bumped uh, in a flattened way okay but there is no any interaction and there is interaction in dark between the dark matter is so less okay therefore the distribution of uh, the dark matter is kind of a spherical way and hence these are completely kind of a spherical way the distribution is approximate as a you can approximate as a spherical density therefore therefore we can say it's form a dark halo so this is your milky way these are black holes you are here we are here and there are so many galaxies like here this one and so forth and from here we are observing the motion of these galaxies and stars and we found out what would be the mass of this halo and so on so we are talking about later so we can say that rho of dm is mass over volume mass is proportional to r and volume is proportional to r cube therefore density of dark matter must be r to the power minus 2 okay now if you want to figure out what is the mass of halo now we know the density so obviously we we have to find this mass of halo so you just integrate it out zero to r so maybe because it's kind of a network you can see here this is completely a network okay having some kind of radius uh, bigger r therefore r square rho r dr is going to give you the so mass of halo now experimentally we have figured out by using the motion of dwarf galaxies and all the sun all the stars the mass of halo is approximately 10 to the 12 solar mass and the rho of uh, dark matter locally locally means because dark matter is present everywhere so locally because we are here in this region so in this region from the motion of uh, from the relative motion of this uh, star we can figure out what should be the dark matter locally which is 0 0.3 geb over centimeter cube so whatever we are actually measuring in astrophysical way we are measuring in eb electron volt so gb 1 gb is equal to 10 raised to the power 9 eb electron volt now from 1 if we are using this equation we can find what is the radius of halo so what is the distribution how the distribution of halo how far the distribution of halo from the milky way we can figure out so this distribution of halo or the radius of this halo is about 100 kiloparsec so my uh, my radius of this uh, galactic disk is 10 kiloparsec. So the distribution of halo is 10 times bigger. So 10 times uh, more dispersed than this dark halo. So uh, so maybe dark halo is from here to here. So it's around this galactic disk, which actually hold the uh, hold the mm, velocity of all these uh, more all these galaxies and stars. Well, now if you want to find how this dark matter particle actually moving, so from again Newton's equation, you can find G M R hello by R hello as we have described here this one. Now you are inside the disk, therefore G M hello bus because you are actually finding what happens to this uh, surface. So from there you can find G M hello by R hello is kind of 200 km per second, and this velocity is so much small, so we can treat as dark matter as a non-relativistic particle. But whenever you have to calculate this Feynman diagram for um, dark matter particle, you will treat as a Lorentz invariant because all the Feynman calculations, all the quantum field theory calculations are valid for this Lorentz group. It must have Lorentz invariant. So the velocity is less. It doesn't mean that it's a non relativistic thing, it's a relativistic thing, but it has lesser speed. It still obeys the symmetry of Lorentz group so what kind of matter may be involved to made this dark matter so we say we have this kind of uh, particles I have fermionic group of particles and bosonic group of particles fermionic means spin half kind of particles and bosonic means spin integer integer number of particles like 0 1 2 3 4 and so on like electron is fermion because its spin is half okay so what if my matter is bosonic now if you have matter if you have a, if your dark matter is a made up of a bosonic particle so one can pack lot of particles in a single phase space what is phase space space is nothing but 
uh, we have Hamiltonian and this uh, X and T, which is making a kind of a fridge space, which occupies a minimum uh, cubic per centimeter cube or whatever the unit you can imagine. So it's kind of a minimum fridge space. Okay. So you can pack a lot of particles in the fridge space. So if you are packing a lot of particles in a single fridge space, it acts as a coherent field. Just like lasers, what happens? You cool it, it has a Bose Einstein condensation because the, the idea of bosonic matter is coming from this Bose Einstein. So you can cool it, cool it, cool it, and it will make this Bose condition. All the particles will be having the same fate, and it becomes, hence it will become, hence it will act as a coherent field. Now, if you are taking a lot of particles in a single phase, single phase space, now you have to check is it stable or not. How are you going to check the stability of this dark halo? Now, you have this hydrogen atom problem. Hydrogen at, in the hydrogen atom problem, what happens? Electron is actually orbiting around the nucleus. To understand the stability, you want to apply this uh, uncertainty principle. What uncertainty principle? That idea I am going to apply here. So, del x del p is approximately 1 by 2. Because in astrophysics, we are going to use t and h bar is equal to both equal to 1. So, we don't have to care about this kind of h bar and so on. De so therefore 2 r h hello into maybe the mass of uh, dark matter therefore we are representing with chi and the velocity of this particle now we have velocity 200 km per second r hello we have 100 kilo per sec therefore the mass the minimum amount of mass or we can see the lower limit of mass we can put that dark matter must have uh, minimum mass could be 10 to minus 22 electron volt. This mass is extremely small, hence we are not actually detecting it. And this kind of a smaller mass is called fuzzy dark matter. Now, if you are converting this kind of mass in kilogram, now you can imagine how small it is. You can see because the electron mass is 0.5 mega electron volt, and now we are talking about this dark matter pa mass particle is 10 to minus 22. It's a lower limit. It's not the actual mass is the low limit. This is the minimum mass, mass it must carry if the dark matter is bosonic, and hence we are calling it fuzzy dark matter. Let's say it's a fermionic dark matter. Now you are seeing you have uh, you have understood these atomic physics cases where your electron in a single orbit can like s p d f in a single shell, it can have just two fermions. Okay, just uh, spin one. Yeah, sorry, uh, up spin and down spin. So, in a fridge space, you can just uh, have maximum one fermion. So, one fermion can occupy a single fridge space because of this poly exclusion principle that you cannot have more than one fermion in a single shell. So, fermion the occupation for one phase single fridge space for one fermion particle must be one. Therefore, mass hello is nothing but the number density times mass of fermion times volume. A number density by using statistical mechanics can be written as integral over this momentum using this distribution of this Fermi function. So, f of p is nothing but 1 by e to the power delta energy minus this chemical potential now plus minus mu. So, if you have plus, then you are having this fermionic dark matter. So, now f of the, this, this gives you nothing but occupation, how these are, how these are occupied. So, f of p becomes 1 and d3p is nothing but this momentum per cube. So, m fermion v to the power cube. Now, m fermion, mass of hello I know, m fermion I don't know, but I know what is the hello, uh, what, is the, what is the velocity, what is the hello radius. And from there, we can find what should be the lower limit for fermionic mass and its order of 10 electron volt. But if you are doing this sophisticated calculation, so mass of fermion can be 0.7 kilo electron volt. So for bosonic, it was 10 to minus 22 electron volt. For fermionic, it has 0.7 kilo, kilo electron volt. And this much of mass you are needed actually to make this dark matter particle if you are looking for bosonic and you are looking for uh, this. Uh, Fermionic. Now you are designing an experiment in such a way to detect these kind of particles and you see what happens. Now for upper limit you can see we can use the gravitational lensing effect and from these astrophysical objects you can find just like for macho which is massive compact halo object 
from there you can have that this much of mass from that much of mass this the dark matter mass cannot exceed this is going to be your upper limit which is my 10 raised to 59 electron volt so above this no dark matter can exist and below this no dark matter can exist well now how much dark matter is present in our universe now we have two kind of dark matter but we need to un understand how is the abundance of dark matter now you are you have probably uh, thought about it that people say 4% of matter is present 26% of dark matter present and 70% of dark energy is present now we have little very little understanding of this 4% of matter and rest 70% uh, rest 96% we don't have any clue about it now 26% we are going to understand from this dark matter but we don't have any clue still because we have not detected dark matter yet but the problem is still very curious that how one can understand how can how one can figure out that how will you measure this four percent dark matter four percent matter is present in our universe how can you say that i don't believe you let's measure it so whatever the gas is present is we are calling it baryonic density now matter density uh, is baryonic density which is four percent which is uh, the matter we have uh, correspond which is our surrounding which we can detect and plus in dark matter so matter plus dark matter gives you total ma total matter density now you subtract from one another and you will have this dark matter how much dark matter is there now you have seen because the universe has some kind of curvature but there is another thing which is called cosmic microwave background i will uh, make some video on this cosmic microwave background what is this in a later video and we will say that the the structure of universe is kind of flat it is completely flat so that there is no any curvature and hence for today from today's observation we can we can actually define called critical density which is 3 h naught over 8 pi g n it is newton gravitation constant 6.6726 into 10 to the power minus 11 and s naught is hubble constant this hubble constant gives you how the universe is actually expanding because our universe is expanding so what is the rate of expansion gives by h naught and if you are calculating it's approximate as 10 raised to the minus 29 g over 10 cube now you want to normalize whatever the density you are going to measure for particles you're going to normalize it and which the normalizing is given by this omega omega is anything you are measuring the density of any matter over rho critical so this is going to give you another density so we, this number is quite good so we are actually measuring we are talking about this omega now from big bang nucleus synthesis now you are seeing that because our universe all the matter all the species of the matter actually came from this uh, big bang so now you have all this nuclear physics which is going to tell you the uh, how this uh, reaction actually happens now from this big bang nucleus synthesis that how these kind of uh, what are the temperatures and what is the binding energy from there you can just calculate what is the deuterium abundance so from there you can calculate the deuterium abundance and the deuterium abundance is going to give you experimentally 0 0.0205 because at the early universe after these all these electron protons after making it they are going to form this compact uh, object like called atoms and from there the maximum number of atom was deuterium so if you know the deuter deuterium abundance in our universe you will know what's more so it will actually give you this uh, figure that uh, how much baryon density is present another way is now because there are so many gases um, scattered around the universe and if lighting light is coming from another cosmos another stars or another galaxies is coming from to us so it is there are so many uh, yeah, if there is uh, so many gases is between that uh, distant galaxy and us so you are good uh, so how much light is actually has actually uh, absorbed uh, by these gases of these baryonic gases is going to give you this baryonic density so omega bh square is 0 0.0205 plus minus it's uncertainty because you do not you cannot have this because it's kind of error you analyze now from also you can understand this from the cmb data and now you are analyzing the cmb data you will get what is the dark matter density and so on and also cmb data provides you the total density of matter because what is that matter density which is about 0 0.308 plus minus 0 0.012 i will see in my little, little lecture how, how to analyze this cmb data now from there we can say 30 percent of the matter total matter so in 30 percent four percent is my baryonic matter which is 
which is we are made up of and this uh, non derivative matter which is we call dark matter is approximately 26 percent so 30 percent and 70 percent of the universe is made of dark energy which is which has a greater role to actually expand our universe so expansion is because of dark energy and the rotation of curves because the rotation of this kind of thing and so dark matter has kind of a, a gravitational effect it has some kind of additional gravitational effect and the and you have probably thought about that why we have this structure of these galaxies how, how this solar system came around how this structure came around is because of this dark energy plus dark matter so if you have not considered your dark matter you cannot produce this kind of large scale structures so large scale structure is because of this dark matter plus dark energy you cannot describe your data for you cannot describe your large scale structure if you are not considering the dark matter in the picture and therefore dark matter plays a great role there are so many theories around like entropic theory and another theory which actually describes the rotational curve that maybe there are something uh, something different going on so that the velocity becomes flattened out but they cannot explain this large scale structures therefore you need this dark matter so badly and another thing is that so uh, in my next lecture we are going to understand what is my thermal decoupling and so on so for that thank you so much please subscribe and share and wait for my next video this is Adnan Minardo Cap signing out